I invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we live in this world that is broken and marred by sin, Lord, help us to remember that our lives are best held in your hands. Lord, help us to hear your word today with clarity, give us comfort, and also give us the courage to truly live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we begin um, a new sermon series. We're in a season of Lent, and Lent is a season of repentance. We focus even more uh, clearly on turning away from our sin and turning toward God. It it matches the 40 days of Lent, matches the 40 walking with Peter as he followed Jesus to the cross. So little snippets from Peter's journey with Jesus. Um, On Sundays, we're going to be embarking on a different sermon series called Life Together. And basically, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at different mindsets that we find within our culture, and we're going to be looking at how um, First Peter particularly helps us to, I guess, hear more clearly how, how God speaks to those various mindsets, and also how our life together as a congregation, as a church, reinforces God's Word and our ability to live as God's people in a world that isn't always easy to live in as sinful people. Um, today, what we're going to be looking at is the mindset that life is better in my hands, okay? The mindset that I should take the bull by the horns and life is better when I just take hold of everything and it's, and it's in my hands. And you can see from the slide up there, I'm gonna, we're going to be doing a little bit of a twist on, on that. So this last weekend, I, um, you may have noticed if you were here that I wasn't, I wasn't in church. Uh, it was just Pastor Sweeney. Um, he helped me out a great deal last weekend. Um, I took a trip to Wisconsin to visit my family. Uh, my grandma's having some, some health issues and uh, so I felt before Lent started, it would be good for me to be able to see her. And I, I'm very grateful to be at a congregation that's supportive of that. Um, we value family here, right? Uh, one of the things, though, while I was there, it was a great visit. Um, got a great opportunity just to just be with her. Um, I had a very interesting surprise while I was there, though. Um, my sister, who was pregnant, was due a week later. I wasn't planning this. She went into labor while I was there. And so this was a really cool thing. Um, she gave birth to a son. His name's Luca. And, well, I got a chance to um, plead my case to the hospital before I left, and they let me in. And I got to hold Luca. It was pretty cool. I got to tell you, it's, it's special. You know, when you, whenever you get a chance to hold an infant, it's, it's special. But when it's, you know, when it's your family, too, it's just, it just, you know, it's, there's just nothing that compares. And, one of the things I've always thought about as I was holding him, I, I kind of found myself just reflecting on all the times I've held babies in my hands, including my own children. And it's remarkable that when you're holding that child, you're literally holding their life in your hands, aren't you? You can't say that many times in your life, that, you're, that you were lit- your life was literally held in somebody else's hands. And as special as that is, and as cool as that was for me, I could, I could also not help you know, th- reflecting on my own life, looking at him, thinking about oh, what, what kind of journey does he, does he have ahead of him? And how many different hands is his life going to be in throughout his existence? And he's already been in the hands of a doctor, the hands of his mother and father, my hands. But eventually he'll be in the hands of teachers, the government, employers, you know. A lot of different people are going to take hold of his life, won't they? So for me, it was, it was a really special thing to be able to sit down with my sister and pray with her and, and pray for Luca um, right so shortly after his birth. And the truth is, is we know this reality, don't we? We all know this. Life is not always better in the hands of other people. Don't we know this? We all know this. I'll give you an example. I hate flying. How many of you have flown before? You like to fly? Yeah, we got some hands. See, good. Participation. This is good. Yes. We like to, some, many of us, I've flown a lot, but I hate it. Every single time I fly, I get super nervous. In fact, I just start spontaneously sweating. Why is it? Why do I get nervous? Because I'm literally strapped to a jet engine, and some stranger that I've never met in my life is going to take this hunk of metal, take off from the earth. It's not going to be attached to anything, and 400 miles later, it's somehow going to land safely, and I'm just supposed to trust in that. Come on now. All of you that aren't nervous about that, I just, I don't get that at all, okay? And just think about how this plays out in our lives in so many other ways, too. On a more serious note, I mean, in the last year, haven't we spent a lot of time talking about how 
Our lives are most certainly not better in the government's hands, for example. Trust issues. Survey after survey, no matter what your political affiliation is, survey after survey shows that people are struggling to trust. And what's our mindset? You know, before I was saying my mindset is I'm strapped to this jet engine. Well, when you're thinking about a relationship with governing authorities, it's how are they manipulating me now? Are they telling me the truth? One more example. Is your life better in the hands of your employer? I bring this up because this ties in with our reading today from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. Peter is writing to, as he writes to the church, he references servants. He's writing, he's speaking, in this section he's speaking directly to servants. And the question we might ask ourselves is, what, is he, what, what does he mean by servants? Well, the best equivalent he's going to be, he addresses here is the, is the employer-employee relationship. And it's not, a perfect, it's not a perfect connection to what we have today. When you think of servant, you might think of a slave. Well, a servant in those days would have been paid, most likely, and they could have expected that eventually they would earn enough money that they could buy their freedom. Here's the caveat, though. Imagine yourself being employed, but you can't change where you work if you don't like working there. That's who he's talking to, okay? So they would get paid, but if they're mistreated, they can't work anywhere else. And the underlying reality that he points out is that, in, that your master's servants will not always treat you well, will they? So living in this world where we're strapped to jet engines and we are <laughs> subject to other people controlling our lives, it feels like sometimes, or, or we find ourselves in a work environment, a family situation, all sorts of situations where it's clear that would not, it's, it's, life is not dependably better in the hands of other people. What's the temptation? What do we want to do? We want to say this. Well, life then is clearly better. In whose hands? Mine. I got this. If only I had complete control over everything, everything would be better. Right? Uh, Well, I want you to think about this. Students, this is what you need to do. You need to get good grades. You need to listen to your teacher. And you never need to get into trouble. And on top of all that, make sure you play nice with all of your friends. Got that? Parents, okay, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you not only have quality time, but quantity time with your children. And all while you're doing that, make sure you raise them up to be the great citizens of this country that you know they're capable of being. And spouses, make sure you also have that quality and quantity time with one another. Make sure you take time to be true to one another. And beyond that, make sure you're bringing in a steady income and you're, you're pleasing everybody at work well enough that you can get Maybe a pay raise. Maybe you could get employed by someone else. An even better job. Oh, and once you have money, make sure you manage it correctly so you have enough for a rainy day. Be sure you eat healthy. Exercise right. Be polite to strangers. I think I could think of a few more. How are you doing? How's life in your hands working out? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we understand this is ultimately true. Life is not dependably better in my own hands. Sometimes a squirrel finds a nut, right? <laughs> Sometimes we do things, but, but at the end of the day, we are all sinners and we fall short. And even despite our best efforts, we fail. We say, I need to eat better, but do we? I should exercise, but do we follow up? Life is certainly not dependably better in our own hands either. Which leads us to this question. What makes us as Christians different in this world? If sin means that we're going to fail and we're going to struggle in each and every day and we can't be perfect, what makes us different? Well, let's take a look at 1 Peter. This time we're going to look a little closer. Remember I told you about servants. This was the section from today. Peter writes, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Okay? With all, show respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So there you go. The underlying reality that your life is not going to be dependably better in other people's hands. There's going to be times where you're going to be dealing with injustice. But he says, still, 
show respect. So what does this mean? I need to take matters in my own hands. I need to grab hold of this and, 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 and just be a better person. No, he goes on. He says, for this is a gracious thing. The word behind gracious is grace, actually. So what he's saying is a gracious thing is being respectful even when your master is treating you unjustly. Okay, so this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Isn't that interesting how he writes that? When mindful of God. You know, I told you, when I struggle, I'm mindful of everything else but God, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm mindful of that pilot. I'm mindful of that person that got elected. I'm mindful of that other person that's making decisions that, you know, and when I make decisions myself, I find myself struggling with my own lack of being able to do it all. I fall short. Peter's saying that when you know that your life is in God's hands, you're all good. See, instead of, instead of beginning life, instead of living life from a place of, I have this taken control of myself, or all those people are going to make everything right. Instead of living life from that perspective, you're living a place from perfect security, the security that only God can give you. What that means is you can face anything, the wrath of an evil master, even death itself. Well, that sounds great, but how? Being mindful of God, how does that help? Well, here he goes on. He says, because, now he points us to Jesus. So where Jesus fits into all of this. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. You're not alone in suffering and dealing with hardship and specifically injustice. Jesus was very familiar with this. He also suffered for you. And he provides us with an example. You know what it looks like to, be, to perfectly place our lives in the Father's hands? We'll look at Jesus. Look at this. He committed no sin. Jesus never did anything wrong. He lived the perfect life. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. So, what did Jesus deserve? Perfect obedience. People listening to him, obeying, right? I mean, there should have been no problems. And yet, when he was reviled, was it, you see what it says right there? He was reviled. He was treated unjustly. But how did Jesus respond? He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus entrusted his life to his heavenly Father. Jesus literally took up his own cross and followed, followed his heavenly Father on the path that he laid before him. And what's interesting is when Jesus was on the cross, do you remember what he says in Luke 23, 46? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He lived a perfect life, placing his life in the hands of the Father, dealing with all sorts of nonsense from sinful human beings. And yet he continued to follow his heavenly Father. And when Jesus placed his life in the Father's hands on that cross, have you ever thought about this? He actually placed your life in, his, in, the, in the Father's hands as well. And this is, the, this is where Peter brings this, this whole conversation to, to its completion here in, in verse 24 through 25. He goes on, he says, He, Jesus himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? That we might die to sin. We might die to this, this false assumption that it's all up to everybody else or ourselves. And instead we would live to righteousness, knowing that he was perfectly righteous for us. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hope isn't found in other people's hands. All too often we place too much of an emphasis on that. And hope is also not found in our ability to do everything right. To be perfect. To be all things for all people. Where is it found? Hope is found in our Savior who daily brings us back into the hands of our Heavenly Father. Being mindful of God. Being mindful of Jesus. That's what you're doing when you come into worship. You're being mindful of Jesus and what he means for your life each and every day. And being mindful of Jesus, you can endure anything. 
And this is what Peter was writing to. If you read all of 1 Peter, the whole point of this is that God's people were dealing with suffering. And he's saying, being mindful of Jesus, you're going to be okay. You know, my family had a uh, movie night this last week, so we watched a movie called Flora and Ulysses. Um, it's based on a children's book. It's a very cute movie. And I've, I've read at least part. I never, I never finished the entire book. I read part of the book. But I, I'm going to spare you details of the whole story, but I, there was this line in the movie that I thought was so cool and applied to us today, so I wanted to share this with you. So the, the basic premise, Flora, I'm not going to share, share all the premise with you because you'll be like, what? But Flora is the main character, okay? And her parents are separated. And there's a point in this story, there's, you get a clear sense in the movie that the hope is that the, her parents are going to get back together. And there's this point in the story where there's kind of a, things are getting really good, and then boom, the bottom drops off, things don't work out so well, and her father leaves again. And she's sitting at the window, she's looking out as her father leaves, and she says, the hardest part about having hope is watching those who don't. And she speaks over and over and over again, do not hope, only observe. (laughs) And the whole point is looking around you, like hope is found in everything else, everybody else, and The point is this. The life she shared with her hopeless parents was making it hard for her to hope. And without spoiling the movie, things only start to change when they actually begin to hope. (laughs) This This brings us to our life together as a church. Christian community is so important. We need to be surrounded by others who find hope, not in the hands of other people or in our own hands, but in the hands of our Heavenly Father being surrounded by people of hope will encourage you to be hopeful. Our life together as a congregation, as the people of God, is to gather around what? The cross. The cross of Jesus. To find hope there. Even as we leave this place, to be encouraged, Bring the story of Jesus, bring that story of hope to our everyday lives, to our families, to our work, to our role as citizens of this country. And through our actions and through our words, what do we do? We say this, life is better in the Father's hands. May it be so for Jesus' sake. Amen.